Welcome back to another episode of Excuse My Grandma. It's Kim and my co-host. Grandma Gail. I hate to talk like this, but I'm just so in the worst funk this week because I actually have gained... Well, because all you do is eat and drink. So, yeah. I mean, this is a problem. I, I know, mean, but I love to work out. I just... Yeah, what Don't. happened to all your, your gym things that you used to no, love I to do? No, I do it. What, you mean in Palm Beach, I would go every morning and do it in the same spot? No, yeah, and, in, and well, in, in Florida, you certainly did it, but but it, even in on your roof, you could take your mat out there. I've been doing it. I just think I've also been eating a lot. Well, you know what? Then you have to be very careful because with COVID and with everybody sitting inside and not really doing all the outdoor activities mm-hmm. that we really normally do, everybody has put on weight. So yeah. now we have to start concentrating on eating properly, not dieting, but eating properly. Yeah. And it's really not good to eat like carbs at every single meal like carbs are good for fuel as we learned from our guests this week which we'll get into um but i think that it's all it's a limit it's limited right you have to in, limit calories it. out like we're not learning anything new it's just about following it you know right well i i can't i i can't follow anything because i could eat pasta five nights a week which but i, I you probably do. do and you're fine well you because i don't eat badly. now my secret to success of keeping my weight almost always the same is i eat Portioning. half yeah. yeah, it's portion control. It really is portion control. And with. But how are you not super hungry then? I'm never hungry. I'm really not. I don't really like food. I think I like candy. I like candy and I like pasta, which is probably the two worst things yeah. to be eating on a steady diet. So Wait, with that. Like, like chocolate bars, you mean? Anything. But I only like junky chocolate. I like like Halloween candy. Yeah. This is coming up to m- my favorite time of the year where Same. I can eat all the little pieces of uh, butter crunches and candy kisses. Oh, what do you think I should be for Halloween this year? Well, I don't know, but don't do anything scary or slutty. I mean, do something like like cute. Those are the only two options. I, no, it really isn't. I, I told you before, I think whatever happened to the nice costumes like Cinderella, Snow White. But there's like uh, slutty Cinderella. Oh, well, I don't. If you're going to be regular Cinderella, what do you mean? Wear a ball gown? Yes. You can't wear it. The thing is, like, little, or if you're no, 12 you can... or if you're six, it's cute. But if I'm 25 and I'm wearing a ball gown, people are like. I think it'd still be very cute because you'd be the only one really dressed like that. Everybody mm, else would be wearing maybe. fishnet stockings and, and some That's kind true. of scary kind of uh, bikini thing. Yeah. And it's always cold around Halloween, too. Like, I remember in Ithaca when I, in college, we would be going to these Halloween parties and it was probably. 20 degrees at the time and we would go in tiniest shorts or skirts and tank tops not even bring a coat because that was like the outfit <laughs> right well that, so and also when you're in your early 20s it doesn't get it, it doesn't feel as cold as well, it really drink, probably you is stay warm also. exactly all right um, kimmy but, l- let's get to our speaker now because i think she's going to really be mad at what we're t- how we're discussing food i know so we're having on tanya zuckerbrot she's a very big following people are obsessed with her um, my mom has been a fan of hers for a really long time and you guys might have heard of F Factor. That's her company that she created. Or if people are talking about GG crackers, that's kind of all part of her diet, all about fiber. And I'm looking forward to hearing her. So everyone, we are joined by Tanya Zuckerbrot. I've been so excited about this interview. She is an internationally known dietitian and the creator of the F Factor diet. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with it. Uh, She's also the author of several books, including the original The F Factor Diet in 2006. So Tanya, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you for having me. So let's start with where you're from and your current relationship status. Um, So I am from New York, uh, specifically from Great Neck, which is uh, on Long Island. I currently live in Manhattan and my current relationship status is beyond happily married, like pinch myself, so happy, Um, man of my dreams. For people who follow you, it looks like the perfect marriage. I don't, I feel like you're going to be like, there's no such thing. (laughs) (laughs) There's not, but I say this as humbly as possible. And I hope it's received with people understanding it comes from such a place of gratitude. I am on my second marriage. And therefore, when I say I'm so happily married, It's because I unfortunately know how painful it can be when you're not. Um, And I went through my first marriage um, really wanting to be happily married. I would see couples that were happily married and just, I was really inspired by it, but also painfully aware that 
that's not what I had. I was married to an amazing man. Um, our marriage, though, um, was mediocre, not because either of us were mediocre, is as a couple, we just didn't have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes my marriage work so much now is that my husband is my favorite person like on the planet. You know, there's That's no one great. else I'd rather be with. I respect him. I admire him. We love to laugh together. He challenges me. He inspires me to be the best version of myself. Um, so for all your listeners, I, I can't imagine anything being more sort of eye roll, like when someone says, I'm so happily married. No, well, we often say, you know, yeah, you have to have common itself. interests together, uh, yeah. you know, which you seem to have now on the second time around. Yeah. Uh, you know, very often when you're first starting out, it's all roses. And then you realize you really have nothing to say to each other. Yeah. So um, at least you got it right the second time. Yeah. No, we actually experienced that once. My husband, who's such a fine person, and, you know, people often comment on the nature of our divorce. You know, it was really important that we divorced mm -hmm. well um, for the sake of our children and frankly for each other. You know, it's so it's, it's probably, you know, a, a topic for another conversation. But, you know, that the way people divorce really, I think, impacts their own personal happiness and certainly, you know, for the children. But when I was married to my first husband, um, we went away to like this really beautiful romantic inn um, somewhere in Connecticut and we were at breakfast and I'm looking around and this couple's talking, this couple's talking, and we're just eating. Mm -hmm. and, I look at and, that all the time with other and, couples. You know, it's it's one thing to have like a moment to yourself, but like we were almost done with breakfast and he looks up at me and there's like tears coming out of my eyes. And he's like, what's wrong? I'm like, we haven't said a word to each other. Mm -hmm. And look, you know, I think if it's two people that don't want to talk, that's great. <laughs> but it, to know me, I don't stop talking. So I'm right. someone that would love to communicate. Um, I'm... I'm very much an emotive person. And I was almost like a widow in my marriage, if that makes sense. I was so lonely. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you know, I think one of the reasons that I, I speak so much about and share so much about my current marriage now is I really want to inspire women. Like if you're not happy, you know, one of my favorite quotes is don't settle for mediocrity where greatness can exist. Life mm -hmm. is too short. Like, don't settle for a mediocre marriage. It's the most important relationship other than the one that you have with yourself that you'll ever have in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. And um, I think when you're happily married, just life is so much happier. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. Um, and I'm certainly not pro-divorce in the sense of if you have children, you have an absolute responsibility to give that marriage everything it deserves for the sake of your children. But once you exhaust every option, if you've tried then you owe it to yourself and to your children to pivot. Mm -hmm. There's so many great things you said. So I have so many follow-up questions. When did you realize in your first marriage that it might've been a mediocre marriage? Like, was it before you actually took the plunge? Was it week one or was it 10 years later? You know, when, when answering these, these questions, honestly, and I am a very sort of honest, direct person, I'm always hedging it with always wanting to be respectful to my mm -hmm. ex course because we're so close and it is the father of, of my, mm -hmm. it's, it's the father of my children. Um, but to answer that honestly, it was really early on. And um, you know, what happens is first of all, um, when we were just engaged, my father had called me into his office um, to speak with me, mm -hmm. but understand I had already bought my gown, the invitations were out. Oh geez. And my father says, you know, I have concerns that this may not be the right person for you. And I was, you know, my, my knee jerk reaction is I'm like, you're waiting now to tell me. You can, you can have this conversation with me earlier. Um, and, you know, I said to my dad, well, you know, why do you think that it's not the right fit? And my father being wiser than me um, said, I just don't really see you guys having a lot in common. And I got very defensive and I said, well, I don't understand why that is going to matter. You know, I'm my own person and it's up to me to continue to evolve and, mm -hmm. and to continue to explore things that interest me. So, and my dad's like, but you don't enjoy the same things. I was like, fine. Then if I want to take a class at the 92nd Street Y, I'll take a class. If I want to go to the theater, I'll go with my girlfriends. If I want to see an exhibit, you know, I'll go with my sister. And that's where my father gave me that line. So as I'm telling him all these things I'm going to do that are of interest to me, sort of without him, 
That's what my father said. So basically what you're telling me is you're going to be a widow in your marriage. Right. Yeah. That and, man, and that happens more than we know, you know, really. But, but here I was in my 20s and my father right. was like, if you can pick a partner in life, like why don't you pick someone that you have something in common with? Mm -hmm. But I admired my husband so much at the time. He was self-made. He was a really nice, good Jewish boy. Mm -hmm. He was a really good son. And, you know, sometimes you it's you're very young, too. Were you both yeah, very young? Crazy, you think you know better, too. Right. So right. that's also why I think I didn't want to give in to like my parents. Um, and therefore, you know, I went forward with the marriage. Um, unfortunately, my father read it correctly. We really did not have a lot in common. And I did become lonelier and lonelier. And, um, you know, there are a few other factors that certainly contributed to, um, mm -hmm. you know, us getting divorced. But, you know, when I did, it really made me quite aware that if I were to marry again, to really marry someone that is going to be your best friend. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to hear about your diet, Tanya, again, <laughs> because it's because I think I need, after COVID, I definitely need your diet. So let, let's get into it a little bit. Absolutely. So if you can just give us a little bit of background about your journey, I guess, with nutrition and how F Factor really started. So, you know, it's, it's, it's ironic that I'm known as like this weight loss guru because it was the furthest thing from a career goal when I went to the space of nutrition and wellness. I opened up a private practice to help make people healthier, not skinnier. So okay. my private practice was a clinical private practice. And I was really focused on applying nutrition intervention to patient populations where I could have the most impact working in an outpatient setting. Now, I know that sounds very clinical, but what it means is that Typically, dietitians are in a hospital providing diets for patients. Right. In an outpatient setting, it means people, you know, it's going to be a more lifestyle driven program, but you mm -hmm. still want to be able to impact people's health, despite the fact that they're, they're living independently. And there are certain clinical conditions, almost all of them, but particularly cardiovascular disease and diabetes that are really impacted when, when they have the right diet. You can lower cholesterol without a statin. You can control sugars without insulin. So... That was my focus, was helping these patient populations improve their health. So I really saw nutrition as medicine. Right. So I was prescribing high fiber diets to the cardiovascular patients because I understood through my you know, formal education that fiber can act like a sponge in your gastrointestinal tract and pull cholesterol out of your body. Therefore, it naturally lowers cholesterol. For the diabetic patients, I was prescribing high fiber diets because the more fiber in the food, the, the, the less sugar enters into your bloodstream because fiber is indigestible and therefore they would get better blood sugar control. By prescribing all this fiber for fiber's clinical benefits, all these patients were feeling so much more full throughout the day because fiber fills you up that they were naturally doing less unnecessary snacking or they were doing less overeating at the next meal. And the result was not only were these patients getting healthier, but when they came for their repeat, you know, blood workups at the doctor's office and they got the weigh in, all these clients were losing weight, even though that was not a goal. The original purpose. No, not at all. But it was a very welcomed, unexpected byproduct. Mm -hmm. Nobody was complaining, you know, having lost a few pounds. And therefore, because weight loss is so evident, you know, I joke that if I'm a chiropractor and I fix your back and you walk into a party. No one's gonna be like, wow, her back looks amazing. Right. But if somehow you lose, let's say 10, 20 pounds and someone hasn't seen you in a few months, you can say, hey, what happened? And the response from these clinical patients was, oh, my cardiologist made me go visit this woman, Tanya Zuckerbrot, to lower my cholesterol. And the byproduct is I've lost 20 pounds and I'm still dining out. I'm still drinking cocktails. I'm not working out harder. So before I knew it, my phone started to ring with referrals from these clinical patients from their friends from their family members or their work colleagues saying, Hey, I'm friends with Joe, or I'm friends with Sam, my cholesterol is fine, or my sugars are fine, but can I get the weight loss part of right. what she did? Right. And that really was the birth of F factor. So the F for F factor obviously stands for fiber just yeah. for, okay. F stands for fiber. Um, and you know, I'm happy to discuss, you know, why fiber, mm -hmm. but in, you know, because I've been doing this for 20 years, what I've learned is that the F stands for so much more. It's, family and friends, because on the F-factor diet, you don't have to remove, you know, family dinners or your social life. Mm -hmm. um, it stands for fun because, you know, as I said, you're not sitting home with some 
sad dinner. You, you get to dine out anywhere. Um, and it stands for freedom. You know, I think that the weight loss space often feels so punitive. You're hungry, you feel restricted. And on that factor, you're eating protein, fats, and carbs. You're dining out. It's so liberating. So can you explain to our listeners how you could go to a restaurant and order the F Factor way? Sure. So F Factor's philosophy is that fiber and protein at every meal makes losing weight no big deal. And it's because fiber revs up your metabolism, which is really important when you're following a low calorie diet. Most low calorie diets end up, you hit a plateau because when you restrict calories for too long a period of time, the body kicks into self-preservation mode. And before you know it, even on a thousand calories, your body's not losing weight. Mm -hmm. Fiber has this amazing ability to actually increase your metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. So the more fiber you're eating, the faster your metabolism gets. In addition, fiber keeps you feeling really full. So the fuller you feel, as I said, the less unnecessary eating you do. But something else about fiber, which is super cool. If you remember, I said fiber acts like a sponge and it can absorb cholesterol. Fiber can also absorb fat and calories in the other foods it's combined with. So it lowers your total caloric absorption. And unfortunately, this country, because due to advances in you know, technology, we've refined and processed all our food, so we don't get enough fiber. So fiber is the first thing. And then the protein is essential for maintaining muscle mass. Beginning at age 30, both men and women start to lose muscle, and that slows down our metabolism. So mm -hmm. everyone thinks they're gaining weight with age because they're getting older or it's menopause, and, and certainly hormonal imbalances absolutely lead to weight gain. But the number one reason people gain weight with age, it's not because they're eating more, it's because they've lost muscle mass and therefore they've slowed their metabolism down and eating the same amount of calories they were able to eat in their 20s or 30s, they no longer can eat that same amount of calories without weight gain in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. So to answer your question, at any restaurant, you can find fiber and protein. Fiber is found in fruits and vegetables and whole grains, and protein is found in um, beef, pork, lamb, veal, all animal you know, uh, proteins, fish, shellfish, cheese, and eggs, and then vegetable proteins such as tofu and seitan. So say you're going out for uh, Japanese food, start off with a salad, a miso soup. If you're on step one, you'll have sashimi or Naruto rolls wrapped in cucumber. If you're right. on step two, you can have real sushi or you know sushi rolls. If you don't like fish, you could do a, a chicken teriyaki. If you're on step one, no rice. If you're on step two, you could have the rice. Mm -hmm. Go for Italian food, start off with a minestrone soup or a tri calori salad. The vegetables are a great source of fiber. Follow that with, I love like shrimp and calamari, fra diavolo, if I'm on step one, which will be you know protein in a mm -hmm. tomato sauce. Or if I'm on step two, that's where you could have, you know, a carb like a pasta. And I think that's the beauty of F factor is that no food is ever taboo. It just depends on what, what phase you're on. Step mm -hmm. one, the most weight loss. So we go the lowest carb and okay. the absence of carbohydrates. That's when your body needs to rely on an alternate fuel source. And that's when you rely on burning fat. Mm -hmm. So carbs are not the enemy. And I really want people to understand that without carbs, you actually feel weak, tired, shaking, cranky. Right. That's one extreme. Too much carb, you'll gain weight because mm -hmm. there's only so much carb your body can store as energy. Mm -hmm. In excess of what your body can store, the excess gets converted to fat. The right. good news is F Factor has a formula and it's built into the program to ensure that each client is getting enough carbs so that you can think clearly mm -hmm. because carbs are what fuel your central nervous system. So you can work a full day, you have enough energy to work out, but you're ensured that you're eating few enough net carbs that your body's burning fat. Right. Tanya, I want to ask you something. Do you still recommend, I mean, I, this is an old an old uh, thing that I think you talked about. I don't know if you even do it anymore. Those GG crackers, which were like eating sawdust. And uh, I mean, that that was a basic source of your fiber. Well, that's your opinion that they yeah. taste like sawdust. Yeah. No, no, oh no. my and gosh. So, <laughs> you know, it's funny. People often thought that I owned the company. Yes, because no, I know that, but I know you don't, but. Yeah, no, and I didn't. So it's like, why would I recommend something without any financial incentive? It's because when I first started F Factor, there were so few true high fiber, all natural products right. that right. were low carbs. The reason it tastes like cardboard is because unlike traditional bread, <laughs> there's, no carb, there's no carb in it. There was, and there was almost no fat. So it basically was a carrier for your protein, but it was basically pure fiber. Right. Luckily, as fiber became more mainstream, so many more high fiber items. Were Products came fiber. out, right. 
So of course, now the offerings are so much more vast, but I still stand by the product. It's, it's a low calorie, super high fiber, very filling, right? Easy to um, sort of Allie, carry, put you know, in your po- put in your pocketbook. But you know, as I said, thanks you know, thanks to the popularity of fiber, you can get fiber from cereals, from high fiber wraps now, from other high fiber uh, pastas, and and you know, F Factor now has an F Factor products, and with that, I can make waffles and pancakes oh, and okay. other carbohydrates that I wish. I could have offered 20 years ago. Years ago, right. Mm-hmm. Everything gets better with time. Right. As <laughs> Except <cool>. us. <laughs> As we're having this conversation about fiber and being regular and stuff, I'm starting to think I'm like, it's a common conversation that people have with their grandparents about eat raisin bran in the morning and whatever. But going those- to the bathroom is a very big issue as you get older. <laughs> so all the fiber you can have it. It's a big issue no matter what phase Same. of life. I have, well, I've you always have to hear issues. moms who are worried about their infants being constipated. So mm-hmm. it's interesting. Right, that's true. I- I think evacuation is one of the most important things for health. Fecal matter is toxic. It's, right. it's so Backs when, up. when you are not evacuating, you actually don't feel great. You feel distended, you feel bloated, you feel dirty. Mm-hmm. On the inverse, you know, inversely, when you go to the bathroom and you evacuate completely, how flat is your stomach? You 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 literally like jump off the toilet bowl, so you happy. feel so clean right. and light on your feet. <laughs> And you know, it's just, you feel so much better. So, you know, I know people sort of get uncomfortable when we talk about like poop talk, but I'm like, guys, I'm a clinician. I've been talking about poop my entire right. career. Right. Now there are so, ads on television that they say it's good to talk about poop. Women, every, exactly. All women poop. I wrote the proposal for the F-Factor diet. Um, when I walked into the room, the publishers, their jaw dropped because I didn't submit a headshot. It was just a proposal. Right. They thought I was going to walk in as a much older author, like, as you said, like a grandmother, because right. think about, you know, my grandmother, it was Metamucil improved. Right. And that's correct. And that's how grandparents got their fiber. So I really discovered fiber accidentally as a weight loss tool. As I said, I was prescribing it to my clinical patients. So I wrote this proposal and they could not believe how young I was. They couldn't believe that someone at my age was mm-hmm. so interested in basically a nutrient that had such an old fashioned image. And I said, I'm going to make fiber sexy. (laughs) That's good. You did. Prunes and Metamucil and stuff like that. That still works, right? It's 100%. Uh, Yeah. I mean, our grandmothers always knew best. They still do. Right. Prunes are still good. Yeah. yeah, My grandma Claire, she had the best say. She always goes, always trust your grandma. (laughs) That's cute. I'm in heaven right now watching this, you know, interview right now, smiling because that was her favorite line. Did she ever give you any other advice, especially when it comes to love and maybe finding a potential partner? Um, yeah, my grandmother was not short on advice. I think Mm -hmm. because, um, she loved me so much and she was just so invested in my happiness Mm -hmm. and she was wise. She was a wise, wise woman. Um, you know, I think my grandmother, the best advice she she actually said is is find someone kind mm-hmm. because looks will come and go. You say and that. I say that all the time. And money can come and go, mm-hmm. right? But kind that hopefully never goes. That's mm-hmm. correct. Um, the other advice that she gave me, she said, find someone who makes you laugh because in the worst of times, that laughter is going to come in really handy. Mm-hmm. Um, and she said, you know, also find someone that you know challenges you intellectually, like. You, because that, then, then you always respect the person. If you think you're smarter than your partner, it's going to start to come out when they mm-hmm. annoy you. It's and that's and you see it. You see sometimes men or women speak to their partners in a way that's so disrespectful, and it really comes from a place of they've lost respect for that person. Mm-hmm. And yep. I know what that's like. And I remember when I was getting divorced, I found myself speaking to my husband in a way that was was really unkind. Mm -hmm. And in going through that divorce, you were in a situation where you had your own company. It wasn't probably as scary as maybe a woman who was a stay at home mom. And what would her option have been? Do you have any advice for people who may be kind of in that situation in having the confidence to have the discussion around divorce? I love this question. I think it's, it's so important. Um, And I'm, I'm happy to address it you know, through my, my own experience. Yes, I did have my own business, which, which gave me the hope of being able to be able to financially support myself and my family. But I'll be honest, at the time, I was trying to scale F factor, I was actually trying to make a competing product to the GG. So Mm -hmm. I was actually taking every dollar profit and reinvesting it. So my bank account read zero. 
And my husband and I, when we got divorced, we had no money. Mm. And I mean, you know, we, when, when we went to the mediator, he took a look at our balance sheet and he went, hmm, okay, so Tanya and Glenn, half a zero, zero. So Tanya, <laughs> get to the it was the scariest thing. I walked out of there crying, shaking. I had to sell my clothing, my jewelry, my handbags, just to keep my kids in private school. I had to borrow money from my parents. And I said to my parents, look, um, I don't expect you to support me um, forever, but can you just help me keep my kids in school for one more year? And then if I need to move out of the city, put them in public school, I will. Um, but I was like, I just want my children to have that continuity for us to get divorced and to pull them out of a school that they've been at mm -hmm. since kindergarten. So I literally did everything I could just to keep my kids um, to you know preserve their education. It's and very brave. You were terrific. It almost became like just a very clear choice that no financial security was worth being unhappy. And if I stayed, if I stayed, I was guaranteed to be unhappy. But if I left, despite how scary it could be, I was actually closer to happiness than if I stayed. And yeah. when I left, um, I moved into a smaller apartment. Uh, it was um, a rental apartment. And um, I could only, um, and not that there's anything wrong with Ikea, but I ordered all the furniture. I remember my bed didn't come in. So I was sleeping on my daughter's bunk bed oh, um, and I was looking outside to the skyline of Manhattan. And here I was, you know, 30 something year old with three kids, no money. It's scary. Um, and I was looking outside, but it was strange. It was the most hopeful I had felt in forever. And as I was looking out to the skyline, I thought, my happiness is out there. And I think that's such an important message and one that I feel like you share on social media, especially in just showing like how happy you are with your family. Um, and you're, you know, I see like your teens even helping you with social media sometimes and what you're doing. What do you say to people who say that sometimes you could share too much? Look, I went through the worst year of my life last year. Last um, year? Last year. Mm -hmm. The absolute most traumatic experience of my life. And my husband um, really feels that it's because I overexposed our life. And, you know, I gave people too much access into my world. Mm -hmm. You know, as a CEO of a company, I could have been behind the screen and I chose to share so much because I'm authentic. And frankly, if you're willing to share that much, you probably don't have much to hide. Just so our listeners who might not be familiar right. understand what Tanya is talking about. Last year, you went through a very public smear campaign. There was a influencer, I guess you would call it, um, on social media saying that, you know, your products were unsafe or causing unhealthy weight loss. So if you can, I guess, address those rumors and also, I guess, how, you know, you got through it and how your family may have helped you get through it. Um, it was horrific. I've been doing this for 20 years. For anyone to accuse me of harming people's health for profit, you clearly have never spent one minute with me. You certainly have never been my client. You certainly don't know me as a friend, as a family member. All I want to do is leave the world a better place than I found it. It's why my husband and I are philanthropic. It's why I chose a career where I'm going to touch people's lives. Like You don't go into healthcare, into wellness, unless you you care about people. Um, so I, I think it's why I truly just couldn't understand why doing what, after selling products for three years and not having changed the product, after doing the F Factor Diet for 20 years without one negative piece of press, never, like you could Google it out of nowhere, all of a sudden it, it, it's, it's revealed that you know, F factor is not healthy, the products out of nowhere. And we also know we test our products. Nothing leaves a facility unless it's tested. I couldn't believe how, how people leaned into it. And I frankly actually lost my faith in humanity. It's, I, I didn't want to live in this world where people were almost watching someone destroy my reputation, my company, my life, my, my mental health. Did you know the person? Personally, oh, no. or this was just a, a, a random writer or a the only time I knew this person is when she approached me at a restaurant like a fan and oh. asked to, you know, take right. video with me. And she's like, I'm with Tanya Zuckerbrot, and I'm, you know, sitting oh. at a Italian restaurant eating pasta of all things. Um, and it was and that was really it. 
So, you know, I think, you know, when you talk about exposing too much, um, the reason that you, that, you know, it's, it's sort of sad when you look back on it, it became so personal for this person talking about the cost of my vacations. Oh, wow. Talking, talking about the, the cost of my homes. It was like, what does that have to do with the safety of the products? I mean, Nothing. It, was, it just sells, it sells her. her. Talking about like my husband, my mother, my sister. It was, it was so personal oh, wow. and so personally violating. Um, and, you know, did you have any redress? Could you do anything uh, to stop her from doing this? No, um, we tried. We reached oh, out, okay. and now you can see all the news about what's happening with Facebook and with Instagram. Right. Well, that's what it is. That's bullying. No, um, my husband wrote to the director of integrity around twenty times, mm -hmm. not an info with a real name, and um, he said, "If you don't remove this person from your platform, my wife will kill herself." He's like, oh, "If God. we were not here, my wife probably will not be here." Um, this was everything I'd worked for. This was my, this was not just a job. This was my legacy. This was, I wrote books on this. This was my company. Um, this was my life's work. And it was also my professional reputation and right. she character. I mean, it was the most oh my gosh. horrific thing I've ever seen. And to know that I was the victim of it is just terrifying. Um, so no, there was no recall through social media. I finally had to sue her because okay. I really need to ensure, I, the way we're looking at it, this has cost my family a lot of money to sue someone that does not have the resources to repay me or my company in any way. Not but it's just to it's save face, you have to do it for your own reputation. I save face because I know who I am right. and the truth has come out, it is a joke. This woman said she had tens of thousands of victims. I don't know where she buried yeah, the body. the proof? Not one, no, no, forget even the proof. Not one person has come forward. Oh. It was all anonymous. Oh, Not that's terrible. One person. And if there were victims, there would have been a class action lawsuit. Right. Or there'd be one person to have sued the company. Very Not sad that somebody person. can just do Why this do you through think social somebody media. Would do that? Well, I think people are jealous. Yeah. A lot of times it isn't even over the diet. It's more about her lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then people are jealous. That's just human nature. You see this with the Kardashians, you see this with all the, the stuff you see on television, these these hypothetical families that are all acting so ridiculous. And people really get they feel they're so sad in their own lives. Why is she entitled to that kind of lifestyle? And I'm not. I mean, I'm not saying that and it was the case in this, but I, but I understand. And I've said to you very often, Kim, that I think one of the big problems with the millennials and your generation is so much of your life is on Instagram. And so much of, uh, you know, I mean, Tanya's life was already done in a book. She's already had a career. She had a business. But then once social media gets involved, as good as many of well, the side effects are, cons, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, you get the fame. But on the other hand, you get a lot of crazy people. My husband says it. He's like, the platform that you used to build F Factor was the same platform used to destroy you. Mm -hmm. Correct. And right. look, I think social media used correctly is amazing. You yes. Know, right. Community. I was using it to educate and to inspire, mm -hmm. but there's also social media that's really abused and people mm -hmm. are using it to bully and to harass yeah. and to denigrate and to stalk. I mean, we weren't just suing her for libel and slander. I mean, it was harassment. Right. Yeah. And what about about your children? I mean, it's yeah, a terrible I problem. For my life. I mean, my yeah. daughter saw this woman the other day and ran home shaking. Oh my shaking gosh. Fine. This is a woman that almost caused her mother not to be here anymore for her. Mm -hmm. It's a it's very sad. That, and that's why I have to sue her because mm -hmm. if yeah. not, she will do this again. Right. right. To right. someone that's else. Right. That's Absolutely. That does or a bully for them. It's just a Tuesday, but for you, it's your life. Right. I'm just like such a people person. And for me, I, I really saw social media as an opportunity to connect with people that otherwise maybe wouldn't have the resources to see me as a client. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't live in New York or they couldn't right, afford right. to be a client. And therefore I was using social media to share my love of that factor with the world uh -huh. almost to a point that like my COO was like this is what your clients are paying for why are you giving away so much and what I've always believed is that God gives us all resources um, some people have money some people have uh, advice some people have knowledge and you're not supposed to be stingy with, with what God has given you so God was so generous and he gave me this education the passion for nutrition and he gave me, you know, this big toothy smile so I can like pull people in and, you know, connect with them and hopefully share with them 
F factor so that they could live their best life. I want to end the episode with a fun little game. Uh, so it's Grandma Gail's red and green flag quiz. This is going to be our food edition with you, Tanya. Okay. So we'll go through a few things and you guys can discuss whether you think it's a red flag or a green flag. When on a date, they want to cook in instead of go out. Is that a red flag or a green flag? Well, for, in your case, Kimmy, it should be a red flag because you're a terrible cook. Yes. But if you would keep it simple and follow maybe Tanya's uh, cookbook, it would be a green flag. Yeah, it's a green flag for me too. I think that cooking can be fun and intimate. Um, it's private, right? You don't have all the noise of a restaurant. So I'm, I'm all for cooking on a date. I love it. Okay. So when the person you're dating is hyper-focused on what they eat and they won't ever have a cheat day, is that a red flag or a green flag? I'll take this first. Major red flag. Yeah, Um, me too. I agree. I'm in the wellness space, but I believe in mindful indulgences. And I also, you know, believe that if someone is almost that controlling with their intake, that bleeds into other things. So, um, and you know, they say that the way people love food, it's how they love sex. It's, 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 it's their, you know, they're people that obviously like sort of live life to the fullest. And I'll never forget. I was, when I was in my twenties, I was on a date with someone and the guy was looking at the, you know, the menus came and he sort of took his menu and they put it down. And I said to him, what are you going to get? And I used to love reading menus. So yeah. I wanted to be a chef. I'm like, Ooh, that looks good. That looks good. That looks good. And he put his menu down. He's like, I don't care. He's like, I just eat to live. Oh, I would end that. I would walk out. And and all I'm thinking is if, if this in any way parlays into what he brings into the bedroom, (laughs) not good. I need more passion. I want someone that, you know, is more passionate about these things, you know? So I was like, yeah, this isn't going to work. So (laughs) I think that's a red flag. That's funny. Uh, Okay. So what about when the person you're with makes a comment about how you're eating or like everything that you put into your mouth? That would be a definite big red flag for me. Like you would break up with someone over it? Well, I, well, first of all, I don't know. Hypothetically, hypothetically, I can't break up after 58 years of marriage now because he doesn't like what I eat. But um, I would say that uh, that would be annoying. I I think everybody has the right to eat what they want and uh, accept, make an exception. If you're in a long-term relationship and you see somebody constantly ordering French fries at every meal, you could say, maybe we shouldn't have French fries tonight, but not being mean, being just say, you know what, let's skip the fries tonight. So um, that would be a red flag. What do you think, Tanya? I agree. Um, You know, I, I, I find it so interesting how comfortable people have become imposing their opinions on other people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's almost like suggesting, like if someone's discussing the way that you're eating, it's, it's really rude actually. Mm-hmm. And I, and I think it, it, it's really, it puts that person in a really uncomfortable position to have to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. So um, I agree. I, I just, I don't like the idea. And, I, and by the way, I don't like when women to do to other women. If someone gets a yeah. salad, exactly. Like, diet, I'm like, Oh my goodness. Like it's, it's just, it's just, I find it amazing how comfortable people are imposing their issues on other people. So I should really tell the story. I was in Charleston with a group of women and we were sitting at a restaurant and uh, one of the women uh, was t- doing the ordering and she's a, she was a big health nut, which is fine. And she said, we'll have a salad and we'll share that three ways. And what are you having, Gail? I said, well, I'm going to have a pizza. She said, oh no, you can't have the pizza. I said, yes, I can. I said, just order the pizza. Well, the pizza came out with the salad. She ordered one salad for three she people. Ate she ate the entire <laughs> pizza. And then I said, I thought you didn't want that pizza. Yeah, that she said, well, uh, she said, it looks so good, but I, I'm laughing. That's the same thing. I yeah. mean, people have to let other people make their own choices about food. And it's funny, you know, as a dietitian, people always assume that I'm going to impose my will on them. Like, and I'm just like, guys, unless you're my client, I actually right. don't care what you eat. You know, <laughs> exactly. if, if somehow what you're eating is a reflection of me, because I'm here to guide you or you know, to be, you know, your dietitian, then of course I'm going to be more invested, right. but you do you, you right. know? I'll do me over here. That's a good one. Exactly. You you. Um, okay. Last one. When they get home at the end of the night after dinner and they say they don't want to have sex because they're too full, red or green flag. 
Like, is that okay? That would have been a red flag for me. And I never had sex before I got married. So I don't have any idea. But if, if a guy doesn't want to have sex every which way and when, then there's something wrong. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, I, I would, I would be concerned too. I think, especially when you're dating, um, <laughs> right. you know, that, that it's, I always say like, you know, think of like, because I have a lot of young girls who work in my office and I always say like what you're getting when you're dating, that's the best of the best. It doesn't get better. Exactly. After it. exactly. So if, if you're dating someone already, they're feeling too full for sex. Like imagine that marriage 10, 20 years from now, you know, so Forget it. Probably a red flag for me as well. Okay. Fair. Okay. Tanya, thank you so, so much for joining us. Can you tell our listeners where to find you on social and how to uh, find the F factor diet? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. And, um, it, I'm just I I love the relationship that you guys have. Thank it you. really thank you um, is so beautiful and reminds me so much of the relationship I have with my grandma. So enjoy every minute together. Um, with that being said, uh, you can find me on social media. It's at Tanya Zuckerbrot, and the company is at F underscore Factor. Um, and you can also visit us um, on um, at our website, which is uh, www.ffactor.com. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode with Tanya. A, a huge problem with social media and the problem that she probably got into trouble with was that people make assumptions without actually listening to a 40 minute interview with someone and actually seeing like this is a real person yeah, who it was has very really sad. built a real business. Yeah, you know? her, the thing that happened to her this past year was it was tragic and it could happen to anybody because and sometimes you know, there's truth to these things and sometimes they're not. That's and that's the problem like we're running into with fake news media all the time, right? It's right. like who yeah. do you believe? Well, yeah. that's that's the truth right? because everything of everybody's life is so public that half the time you don't know which is reality and mm -hmm. which is fake. So uh, I, I hope you all enjoyed it. And I think we should end this on a light note that I think you, the, everybody should watch. Um, Our 1950s movie of the week. Yeah, and, we, and um, I think it should be um, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Because when you're having F-Factor for breakfast... <laughs> you'll, you'll end up looking like Audrey Hepburn, yeah. <laughs> which is highly unlikely. But anyway, By the way, the movie is 1961. It's not technically 50s. But yeah, but it's it close is, enough. It's adapted from Truman Capote's yes. novel, which was 1958. Correct, so. correct. And Audrey it was Hepburn and it's beautiful. playing Holly Golightly. That's a good Halloween costume. Oh, she, in her little black dress with her cigarette. Yeah. Yeah. Holder. Hair and a little tiara. She had a tea. Oh, she Did was she? so yeah. beautiful. She was so beautiful. It really was a pleasure. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the movie and I hope you enjoyed listening to our uh, conversation today. And you know how to follow us on Instagram and on TikTok. Our following is growing by the minute. It's at excuse my grandma and write in any of your questions as well. And we will see you next week.